Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. From wherever you may be participating, you are welcome to our, which is your community, data site annual community meeting meet, uh, meeting 2023. This is the best practice session and we'll be looking at GUI workflow best practices, regional exemplar from our members. And today we'll be having Doug Patterson from Care University presenting to us. Also, we have him from the library of um, King Abdullah, University of Science of Technology. We'll be having Dari Grains and Rawan Council. And also we'll be having from International Institute of Tropical Agriculture, Afis Adepoju, will be presenting to us. So if you have So if you have joined us, you can participate with us on Twitter or Mastodon and our hashtag for today is Data Site 2023. Please go online and share your thoughts. You can review the Data Site Code of Conduct as being shared with us in this Zoom meeting. After the event, we encourage you to fill the survey. Also, the slides and recording of the event will be shared afterwards. Please enjoy yourself as we start. Now, we'll be handing over to Tugi Parasin as it starts. Yes, thank you. I will start. I hope you can all see my screen here. Is it working? Sure, it is. Great. So, um, yeah, hello again. I'm Torge Peterson. I'm part of the research data management team at Kiel University in Germany. And today I will share some insights into a project that is uh, undertaken by our Botanical Institute and the Botanical Garden. It's the Herbarium Kiel or Kiel Herbarium, uh, which is currently being digitized and includes the registration of IGSN IDs, um, so International Generic Sample Number, uh, which is basically a DOI. So let's have a quick overview. Um, the herbarium is, like I said, created by the Botanical Institute and Botanical Garden. It's a collection of approximately 250,000 specimens spanning over a quarter, quarter century. It includes diverse plant groups, pharmacy collections, seeds, and even pieces of wood. And at the core of the general herbarium, there lie specimens gathered uh, from 18th and 19th century research expeditions. And these specimens were collected by renowned explorers such as Alexander von Humboldt or Joseph Dalton Hooker. On the right side, uh, you can see a photo of the old storage, a picture that hopefully soon will belong to the past. Uh, over the years, the herbarium faced challenges like moving uh, places to world wars and that left visible marks on its past year. So also the use of acidic paper had an effect and made the sheets a little brittle. So all specimens will receive new protecting sheets and will be stored in durable cabinets within the next years. Uh, since 2021, we've also received funding to protect this heritage through the preservation of written cultural heritage program here in Schleswig-Holstein. And within these preservation efforts, um, yeah, we also want to digitize and, and make the collection accessible. So in, in alignment with this preservation efforts, we try to improve the accessibility according to fair and open data principles. Um, we're making the collection accessible to everyone, starting with the general herbarium, which is also the oldest part. Uh, the data is published in a specimen database and virtual herbarium, Jack. It's a jointly administered herbarium it's in, in, based in Vienna, and where users can easily search and, and explore the collection. On the right side, you can see a collection overview uh, of our Kilabarium or snippet of, of that collection overview. Yes. And in this process, each specimen is given an international generic sample number to make the identification and citation effortless and also to improve the discoverability. These efforts are carried out by our Botanical Institute members often in their spare time. So it's, a, I guess, a long lasting process. Let's have a quick overview of our digitization workflow. Of course, we safeguard herbarium sheets, put them in sturdy cabinets. Um, we 
maintain the historical taxonomy in the cataloging process. So we can preserve the original context of each specimen. But for today, more important is the PID assignment. So each specimen receives a unique identity through QR codes with IGSNs on it, ensuring the permanent and easy identification and discoverability, retrieval, citation, of course, improves everything. Um, we have a photography step where high resolution imaging captures the specimen details. On the right side, you can see our scanning device. This is a herb scan light box. And all the metadata that is on the sheets is then entered accurately in, in an in-house database that is provided by a local company, Phase HL. And it ensures a consistent, reliable metadata collection. An expert reviews the data afterwards, so we have some guarantee for the quality and reliability as well. In the last step, we publish this data. It's exported to the virtual herbarium jug. And of course, our IGSN metadata is then updated, ensuring that the information remains up to date. I actually said updated because we have implemented the IGSN ahead of the transition to data site registration services. Um, before the transition, um, we only had registered IGSN IDs or legacy IGSN IDs for our digitized specimens. Registering became then necessary during the transition to data site because we had a lot of QR codes already placed on the on the sheets, but the sheets were not digitized already. So this was a, a, a process, a streamlined process, and um, now all IGSN IDs that are printed on QR codes have been aliased and have been registered. Um, IGSN IDs of already digitized specimens are findable. And so we have some discoverability for those entries where also the metadata already exists. And, and linked are these legacy IGSN with alternate identifier property to the, to the new IGSN and, and, and vice versa. This was an automated process during the transition to data site in, in, in early 23. And yeah, it worked very well, thanks to data side again. When we generate our metadata, um, first the, the metadata is entered by staff in an in-house database. You can see also here the input form of the database. There are some yellow fields. Uh, the form is also much longer, but the yellow fields are not transferred to Jack. And I wasn't much involved in this. This is, is more from the discipline specific point of view and the so, so local company accomplished it with my uh, with the local botanical institute here so the data is then transferred to jack after an expert review and there are also some norm data linkages uh, that are applied so um, we provide the data to jack and they are already enriched with some pids like orchid ids wikidata ids they use a, a bf um, virtual international authority file and they also use uh, a couple of discipline specific pids such as the International Plant Names Index. On the right side, you can see the input form of our in-house database and the entry in, in, in JAC. The scans are provided to an IIIF viewer. Some of you may notice that the IGSN is not shown on the landing page so far, but we are still working on implementing the best practices there. So we transform the data when we register IGSN or when we update the IGSN. And we mainly utilize the uh, already present information of the JAK export. So the transformation is handled by a small Python script. This can be automated. And we try to find at least one name identifier and affiliation identifier for each person involved. So we also try to gather more identifiers, uh, identifiers based on the given ones, uh, for example, the G and D which is here in Germany um, used in many, in many cases. And we are, I try to identify the roles of the contrib contributors to provide the contributor type. So for example, we have here the data collector, Bernhard Luschnert. And if we have date information, such as the collecting date, we add it with the appropriate date type as well. And then we use some other technical info, such as plant family taxonomy terms or uh, genus and so and so on in the description and title fields. So this can be utilized in the data site search. Of course, we also utilize other discipline and not discipline specific metadata like the geo information and so on. To ensure a certain data quality, this is all reviewed by an expert um, in the discipline. 
Um, but regarding the IGSN rest registration, the transformed JSON data, which is according to the data site metadata schema, uh, this can be uploaded to our central IGSN servers. Um, we started such a service this year here in Kiel University, and it offers some features. So, um, for example, data management members or, or respective data stewards can review registration requests. And it's, it's kind of like a, a fabrica for our university employees. And we have some schema validation there. We use autocomplete name identifiers for ORCID and on research organization registry IDs. Um, we have landing page fallbacks, and you can see a landing page on the right lower side here, which is a fallback, which is uh, provided by our service. And of course, um, we have much user documentation. So all of these measures help to follow the data site uh, specific best practices when registering IGSN IDs, especially here in the university context where are multiple institutes registering IDs. So last slide, the current status. Um, we are very happy with the data site transition and um, works kind of well for us. We have for now only 31 discoverable findable entries. This will accelerate. There are a lot of entries in our in-house database that will soon be published. Um, we have um, findable entries that have collector information and respective contributors. They all have been linked and with at least one name identifier. Uh, we are utilizing the QR codes in the cataloging process, which is very handy. And yeah, our legacy IGSN still persist and we can work with the new DOI IGSN IDs while providing discoverability only for the already digitized entries. So this all worked out very well. And as well, we yeah we are going to uh, revise entries into Chuck database. We're still working on the implementation of the best practices for the external landing pages like here with Jack. It's a jointly administered system, so this takes some time. And yeah, then there are some other technical things like the triple IF protocol and we're we're, we're tra transitioning our in-house database to a modern software stack. So this is it. This was a quick overview. I hope you have gained some insights in our process. And if there are any questions, just follow up. Thank you, Sergey. We really appreciate that. And for our participants, please, if you have questions, kindly post it in the queue and hey, who will have special time after the three presentations for curation and answer and as well as discussions too. Thank you very much. Now let's have uh participate, I mean our presenters from Abdullah University of Science and Technology from the library of that institution. Over to Daryl and Rawan. You may kindly share your screen. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yes, so uh, I will start today by introducing uh, some of the uh, basic things that we are doing to connect our records uh, using identifiers. And then Rowan will talk about a new pilot project we have started. Um, so our repository has been uh, was established back in 2011, and we started using ORCID IDs in 2015, and then we joined DataSite and started registering DOIs in, in 2018. Um, our initial decision to join DataSite was because we wanted to uh, support dataset and software archiving. Um, but we also wanted to provide DOIs for other unique materials. And for us, it's turned out so far that this, uh, the focus of our DOI registrations has been on uh, providing DOIs for our theses and dissertations, um, though we do have a number of data sets and other materials as well. Um, so when we joined, uh, data site, our repository records already had ORCID IDs for many of the people who are authors. 
uh, especially on theses and dissertations, because we had been requiring uh, student ORCID IDs since 2015. Um, we also have ORCID IDs on most of our data set submissions, uh, even though the users aren't required to make the connection during the submission. Um, if we have a confirmed ORCID ID for that uh, person from our university, we will add it to the record, even if they didn't add it during the submission originally. Um, so most of our DOI metadata that we send to data site includes the name identifiers as an ORCID for the authors. Um, and this has been successful. And I think we have uh, benefited from this process. And it's been straightforward for us. Um, for affiliation connections, uh, we have done less. So oh, we, during our submissions for most items, we only collect, or we only know actually um, if someone is a Kaus person or not. And if there are authors that are not affiliated to Kaus, we don't actually know normally uh, who their affiliation is to. Um, so we only include affiliation entries for the authors if they are Kaus people, um, but we do now include the ROR ID for Kaus on those uh, affiliation entries. Um, the other types of relationships uh, through identifiers that we have started adding are um, related identifiers. Um, so this is most common for the data set submissions where we do ask the submitter to identify um, if their data set is a uh, supplement to a paper. Um, the authors have an option just to list the title or text citation. And actually this is most common because normally when the data set uh, was um, submitted, the article had not been published yet. Um, so then we go back periodically to check if the article has been published and add the identifier for that article. And then it will have the relationship in the data site metadata. So these are the records basically that have related identifiers um, in our uh, registrations. Um, there are a couple of these that do have um, inverse relationships. So a few of the theses and dissertations that have an is supplemented by relation is actually to a data set that is uh, in our repository that then also has the inverse relationship, but most of these relations are to external DOIs or URLs. Um, okay, and the last part here is what um, my colleague Rowan will talk about where we've been doing some work to try to add uh, reference lists uh, to thesis and dissertation records. Rowan? Thank you, Darren. So this work have been done with uh, as a collaboration between us and uh, in Columbia University, Esther and Fred. And um, as Darren said, uh, it's a workflow that we want that we want to test to add uh, reference list, uh, display the references in our repository, and disseminate this reference list relationship to our uh, record through data site metadata. Um, so we start with requesting the BIPTEC file from the student. We email uh, 200, around 200 students who complete their thesis into 2022. Uh, after that, we decided to set uh, an automation or automatic notification to be sent to any student who archive uh, uh, their thesis of dissertation and uh, 
we didn't get really high uh, response, uh, only 16 responses, and uh, the reference list uh, added only two separate records. Um, so next, I will talk about uh, converting uh, the reference or the biptic file to XML. So uh, we, con we converted the biptic file to XML using BHP. Some of the challenges that we ran into that um, every biptic file is different and uh, not all the same. It's they will, uh, some of the biptic file will include uh, uh, extra special character or extra uh, bracket. And uh, also we noticed that uh, some biptic files, including uh, extra note at the beginning, in the, uh, the first line of the file that uh, been produced or generated by the program being used to generate the biptic file. Um, also uh, some uh, identifier maybe state differently. Uh, for example, ArcSef DUI, ArcSef IDs, uh, it will be uh, identified as URL or DUI. Um, talking about uh, converting the BIP file to XML, uh, when, when we were uh, mapping the, our XML to data site uh, XML, uh, main two things we need to, or we thought about, uh, using related uh, identifier or related items for the reference that we have and the relationship uh, type that we want to use, its site or reference. So our decision were, um, Daryl, if you can go next, please. Yeah, so our uh, decision were to create a related item for all the entries or entries for all the reference that we have. Addition to that, we create related identifier entry for the reference with URL or DUI. And we decide to use reference relationship type, uh, which is equivalent to site relationship for our purpose. Okay, this is one thing we noticed that uh, only the DUI reference uh, that will be show in uh, uh, data site comments. And if we remove a related identifier, it will not be removed uh, the citation from data site comments. Next, we can see an example of how uh, the record look like with all uh, the reference showing in data site comments. Um, and that's all what I want to share with you today. Please let us know if you have anything to ask in the question. Basu. Oh, sorry, I was muted. Sorry. Thanks so much, Rowan and Daryl. Sorry, I'm sorry. I, I never knew I was muted before I was talking. So sorry. Thanks for that. And I think, I mean, that's good to see how we can use related identifier with high and the metadata. That's a good one. And also, I want to appreciate what you have seen concerning IGSN with what Kale University is doing. Now it's over to Afis. Afis, you may kindly share your screen. Hey, um, good morning. I'll share my screen right now. Oh, open my screen is up now. Yes, it is. Oh, good. Yes. It so. Is. Yeah, this is um the DOI best practices uh do IITUE. I'm Afis Adepoju. I'm the data repository officer and the programmer for uh, IITA, that is the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture. So um we kick start this. 
So um, in IITA, we utilize um, DOIs. Um, the DOIs we generated um, through a uh, data site. We have uh, different uh, research products from uh, um, research, uh, I mean, journals and article publications. We have uh, images from our researches. We have uh, documentations. We also have uh, data sets, and uh, these are the uh, research products we actually generate uh, DOIs for, and especially on um, data sites DOI. And uh, at the moment, uh, we have um, over 3,000 findable DOIs that have been registered with uh, data sites uh, precisely. That is um, 3,237 uh, data sets that are uh, registered with uh, data sites and all these are findable even through um Google data sets search you still get a uh, IITA uh, research products special data sets and as well as publications even through Google Scholar you have a uh, DOIs there so um, we have a workflow entity management workflow that you can see on screen and uh, at this point we can see where we assign a uh, DOIs to our research products. We have, uh, we receive the raw data from the start to our researchers, our scientists. Then we have our uh, data curators as well, who do uh, the quality checking for each of the uh, data sets as well. Then uh, we have uh, uh, the data curators too, who stay updates uh, the data dictionary of our data sets. We also have the institutional data manager who uh, reviews the quality for quality assurance and quality control. Then the data curators still uh, updates the CG core metadata, the CG core metadata schema. This is uh, a thematic uh, metadata schema for agriculture uh, used uh, through the, uh, the uh, CGIAR consortium. So uh, as a the repository officer, once this uh, metadata has been uh, completely filled, it will be mapped to uh, the data side metadata schema version 4.4. So we can see we assign our DOI using uh, the Fabrica, the DOI Fabrica from our uh, data site. Uh, we have uh, been generating you know, um, the metadata to the CG core metadata schema, which is uh, easy to map to CG, the data schema, data schema version 4.4. The uh, CG core uh, is an extension of uh, the Dublin core, as we will see in the few slides to be shown. We can note that um, the data site metadata, I mean, the DOI Fabrica is uh, intuitive. You know, generating DOI is uh, straightforward as long as we have uh, the all uh, metadata details, especially if you have been using uh, uh, metadata schemas, you found it very, very easy to uh, use the DOI Fabrica because uh, we use the CG core metadata schema. So it is easy for us to map uh, this to uh, the data site Fabrica uh, metadata schema version 4.4. So we are able to provide uh, a rich metadata, which has really helped us uh, increasing the findability, accessibility, interoperability, and usability of uh, um, research products. So uh, we have like um, over 90% of all the details uh, required uh, to be filled in the um, DOI Fabrica. So we can see uh, this is uh, a kind of a uh, mapping, although this is the the uh, left side, which is in yellow, are the uh, schema details from uh, the CG, um, the data site uh, API, where we have uh, the type of the DOI. It is published. I mean, that is um, findable. If it's uh, the name of uh, the um, creators, we have that. We also have the identifier of the creator. That is the ORCID. You can see we have uh, the type, creator type here. We have the creator. And this, we can see it has been mapped from the CG core metadata to the data site metadata schema. The CG core, like I said uh, earlier, is a, a thematic metadata schema for agriculture. And uh, the IITA is a uh, an agricultural research institute. So we map these uh, CG core metadata to the data set metadata schema version 4.4, which is uh, seamless. And uh, we also exploit uh, the data site APIs for uh, DOI generation. We do some um, integration with 
databases. We have uh, different research databases that are thematic areas of the institution. We have a cassava base for the, the cassava uh, crop research. We have a Musa base for the Musa base, uh, I mean, banana crop research. We also have a yam base for the uh, yam uh, crop research. And also we still have uh, the genetic uh, resource uh, center, which have a uh, genesis. So we map uh, all these uh, metadata from all these databases or these uh, metadata are not structured. So we have uh, employed uh, the VAPI API, which is the read-based API. We uh, pass the metadata to the second API, which is the uh, institutional data repository API. So this maps the unstructured APIs I mean, structured metadata to the CGCOM metadata to the second APIs. So from the second APIs, we uh, pass that to the data side APIs, which will map the uh, CGCOM metadata to the uh, data side metadata schema version 4.4, which is easy for us because uh, the CGCOM metadata already has all the details required in the uh, data side metadata schema. So this makes it easy for us to really map uh, the metadata details and uh, we generate uh, DOIs automatically for these uh, data sets coming from the databases. So uh, we also uh, utilize uh, the DOIs to generate multi-standard uh, citation on our repositories. We have this on our uh, uh, data repository, that is the data.iit.org. We have uh, the uh, multi-standard citation here to the host site uh the features between data site as well as uh, course ref so data um, the course site has a, a myriad of data citation standards so we just plug into uh the course site to pick uh, like um 10 of these uh multi-standard citation styles to put on our repository we can see here we have uh, a way to link uh to our dois Data site DOIs, the DIs we generated to data sites to get uh, the different citation styles. So when you use our uh, if research products, there is no, um, it is easy to cite each of uh, the research products. So uh, also, we link our ORCID, these are the ORCID ID of our researchers to uh, the data sets, I mean, that we have on the repository. We can see, um, I'll walk you through uh, how this is done in a bit. So we make it in such a way that the uh, data sets or whatever research products you have on a data site with the, with the data site DOI will definitely show up in your works on your ORCID profile. So um, to do this, you do that from uh, the ORCID profile of uh, each researcher, which we have uh, trained them on to uh, link their ORCID with data side DOIs. So um, from the ORCID, you can see you add works, click the search link, search and link um, option when you want to add uh, works to your ORCID profile. Then you select data sites. You can see where the data site is, you select data sites. So from the data sites, you get uh, an option to create a token for your um for the connection between data site and the, your ORCID. You can also do this with your GTOP, but we do that uh, with our ORCID IDs. So um click that to get uh, the token as well. Then also uh once the token is gotten you have to update the uh settings then uh with that you get uh your data sets I mean could be data sets, could be publications, as well as uh, any other um, research products that you have your DOIs, I mean, your ORCID on, and as data sites uh, DOIs. So these will be linked to your um, ORCID profile. We can have um, this particular scientist we have here as um, a lot of uh, data sets, I mean, DOIs. I'm not just permitted to scroll through this page. So he has uh, a lot of uh, data sites I mean, the um, DOI is pulled from his uh, data site um, well, publications to his ORCID profile. Then uh, also, lastly, well, not least, we also link uh, the publications, I mean, the research articles to uh, the 
uh, data sets we have. So we have the data sets. We also have the publication itself. So we have a way to link uh, the two. We have the DOIs from each uh, publication goes back to the data sets uh, used in the publication. So um, we do all this using a data site, uh, DOIs, usually the data site, the DOIs we generated to data sites. And uh, we still have um, more services that we are trying to um, um, annex to the data site, like the data the citation counters, the downloads, especially to um, data site commons, which we are working on. So, and we still hope to work more on all these um, services. Um, if you have uh, any questions, I will welcome them now. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Hafiz. Yeah, thank you so much for the fantastic presentation. And good to know that you are using that uh, feature in Commons to push all the publications that you are having to the ORCID uh, records. Yeah, so to uh, all the presenters, please switch on your cam. And to all the attendees, if you have any question, please post them in the Q&A box. And Hafiz, you may stop sharing. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. So if you have any question, please post it in the Q&A box. And yeah, while we are waiting for the question, I just have an idea. And within our conversation with the Gap regions, and I'm sure also my colleague uh, Busun agree, agree with me on this uh, point, we re usually receive inquiries. OK, so I have uh, a repository, and I'm going to you connect it with data site and connect it with the DOIs. But I have a full text information and metadata information in Arabic or in, uh, for example, in Thai or in Hindi. Can I still connect with data site? Can I still use uh, DOIs for my content? So maybe Dariel and Rawan, given your experience with the King Abdullah repository, maybe you have a full text and metadata information in Arabic, if you can share uh, your experience with that. Uh, so we are not a good example because actually our university, uh, the metadata and full text is normally in English. So I see, okay. Yes, sorry. No worries. But just so that you know, the answer is usually yes, you can still register even if the full text or the metadata information in a different uh, language, you can still register uh, the content. Hafiz, do you want to add anything? Yeah. Yes, um, in IIT, because we have a science, it's a diverse um, research environment. Sometimes we get some metadata that are in French. So it is, um, once we can convert this uh, to the French, we can, uh, Puts that in um, the DOI, I mean, the DOI Fabrica using uh, any language we prefer, usually French, because we work with uh, some people who speak French. You know, so I know we do um, implement some meta DOIs using French. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Hafiz. And we have a very interesting example for uh, in Asia, for example, the National Research Council uh, in Thailand, they are registering a huge number of, uh, of data sets uh, in Thai languages. So all the metadata information are author names, publication titles, all these information uh, are presented in the Thai language. So this is a fantastic uh, regional example as well. Yeah, if you have uh, any questions, please put it in the Q&A box. I don't see any questions until now. I I was asked, I, I mean, I have a question from a member that was talking about IGSN. And it was one, the, the member was wondering whether creating samples and at the same time having paper publications was talking about what could could there be a problem with the identifiers because they are not the same so i don't know whether so okay as experience both maybe yeah, uh, sorry but i didn't get the question right so what is actually the problem when i register a sample how i can cite the sample then in a publication or um, yes. what actually 
Yes, I think this is basically the same with a typical DOI. Um, there's a difference with the legacy IGSN. Before we had a prefix for the whole IGSN namespace. It was uh, 10, 2, 7, 3. And all registering members had to divide this namespace by using uh, prefixes in the suffix namespace of a DOI. And this changed. So now we can create repositories as much as we want. Um, the data site best practice and I think it's also a rule is that uh, you put only IGSN in a single repository and don't mix it up with other types like texts, or text documents or whatever data sets. And so before we could recognize IGSN just with the prefix, now it's not possible, but I think there will be some services in future that can do this. I think Datasite has this on the roadmap, so we can basically identified by the um, prefix then as well. Um, maybe this will help in publications to further point out that this is a sample um, identifier and not a text identifier. But I think from a DOI, you can't uh, see it as well if it's a data set or a text resource. But maybe I'm talking too much in the wrong direction. Um, if the person could specify the question, uh, maybe I can further direct to a good answer then. Yes, I, I think you are addressing it because the organization was thinking of combining both samples with publications in the same repository. And they were asking me, how would they be able to separate samples from publications? And because they consider their samples to be IGSN and uh, publications will be DOI, which is what you are just addressing. Yes, yes, that's right. I would, I would basically have separate uh, repositories then, um, but make use of the um, related identifiers and is cited by um, and, and the inverse directions and so on. Um, this would be helpful, I think, for, for the discoverability then. Um, if, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll jump in a little bit. So I'm, yes. I'm Rory Edmonds. I'm the, the samples community manager at Datasite. So um, IGSN IDs are now functionally DOIs. So there is no distinction um, in Datasite systems um, or services as regards um, an IGSN and an, an, another DOI at the record level. That is something, as Torga has kind of alluded to, is something that's definitely on our roadmap and something that we are very keen to implement um, as we move forward with the data site metadata schema. At the moment, we are recognizing IGSN IDs at the repository level. So again, uh, as Torga has, has mentioned, we basically have a repository type that is the, an IGSN ID catalog. Um, and so you create a specific repository account and prefix as an IGSN ID catalog. You only put samples within that. That allows us then to filter searches. It allows us to filter harvesting. It allows us to monitor and help people who are registering samples as they do as they do so. So it, we have a good solution, but not necessarily the perfect solution. And we have made recommendations as regards how do you um, put uh, site samples within the literature. But I think that is a, an entirely difficult question anyway, because samples are already very poorly cited within the literature. So there is there is already a problem that we need to address and talk with the, the um, publishing community and get some consensus both within the samples community itself and with, within the publishing community. So there is already that difficulty. I mean, we know that citation of, of, of text documentation is, is easy. We know that data is improving, but not perfect, but something like samples is still rather in its infancy by comparison. So I apologize for jumping in, but I just hope that that helps uh, clarify things a little bit. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Rory. So please, if you have any question, you can post it in the Q&A box. Maybe you can give it uh, one minute if you have any questions. Uh, 
Okay, I don't see any questions. So thank you so much to all uh, our speakers. So I can see a message from, yeah. So yeah, thank you so much to all our speakers today for sharing their uh, interesting development uh, with the community. We highly appreciate your uh, support and your presentations. Again, all the slides uh, will be available at data site uh, Zunodo community and all the recording of this webinar also will be uploaded to data site YouTube channel. At the end, once we close the webinar, you will receive a poll. So please give us uh, your feedback. This is very, very important for us. So share your feedback with us. And thank you again for attending and joining uh, data site community sessions. We'll have also sessions throughout the day in different time zones. So yeah, please uh, do join us. Thank you so much for your uh, participation.